might look at it and go, you know what, there's a whole lot of variables. We walk in and there's 50 donkeys tied. The one you get is going to be the right one. And however it works, Jesus makes sure that things work that way. And so I think that's what we've got to focus on here. And the excuse that the Lord needs him is, well, yeah, of course he does. We'll bring him back when he's finished. Okay. And it just works that way. So there's a lot of things that could go wrong with this, but, but they don't. And so as you look at what happens, Jesus sits on the donkey. They put their coats, it seems like there's two of them, and they put their coats across two donkeys. I mean, the donkey and the colt. Maybe he just rides the colt, because that's kind of the prophecy. But I don't know exactly how all of this worked, but there's cloaks on the donkeys as they're riding in, and it says them, and so it, it talks about them together. And then the people say, well, that's really not enough just to do that. What we want to do is we need to have this shout of praise. And so let me put my coat for you to ride on to kind of pave the way in. And then some say, well, you know, you're not, I, I'm not using my coat, but let me get a palm branch. And so they put palm branches on the road and they, they pave the way into Jerusalem. And as he rides, this is not just a short distance, like from here to the parking lot. This is going to be a longer distance. This is going to be quite a ways to be able. It's like from here to your house. And when you think about going that. Now some of you live further away. So it's not quite that far. But it's, it's a ways to be able to get there. And as they're going through all of this. And, and coming into Jerusalem. This is how the conquering heroes came in. Always when you came back from battle. And you were the conquering hero. They arranged a parade as you came in. And all the people would cheer because now you're the hero. You're the one who has conquered. You're the one who has come. And so Jesus does that. And as he comes into the city, the people are shouting. And the thing that they're shouting is so great. Hosanna. It means Savior. It means that there's a person who saves. It is a term that they use for Messiah. And so it's this hero's welcome that he's coming into. It's basically a faith parade before the final test. And that's really what they've come to. It's a parade for Jesus and one that he does for himself. So Hosanna to the son of David. Why is son of David? He's not David's son. He's Joseph's son, right? Did they just get them mixed up? No. The term son of David is because David was king, and David's been dead for a thousand years. And so the son of David is the next one who's going to sit on David's throne. He's the one who's in the kingly succession. He's the one who is the Messiah because that's what was prophesied. And so this is our Savior who comes to sit on the throne of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is great praise. This is incredible praise as they bring him into Jerusalem and as they see all of the people around shouting. This is what it should have been like all the time. Where people recognized Jesus. They knew who he was. They knew what was going on. They knew exactly how it happened. And that he was the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And so Jesus is making that statement now. If you had any doubts, I am riding into Jerusalem as the Messiah, as the Son of David. And people call him Savior. That's what they say. Hosanna. That means this is the one to save us. What an incredible sight it is. I don't know that we quite understand it. Have you ever seen anything like that? I haven't. I mean, we play the story again and we'll act it out sometimes or things like that. And there's sometimes, but, you know, we're not very good at, at religion breaking out in public places. It just doesn't seem to happen that much. You know, if you do, you get very uneasy and, you know, very worried about what's going to happen and how this whole thing is going to work. And, and so everybody kind of scatters and says, oh, yeah, there are those people over there. And they're passing out flowers and just don't go over there. Don't make eye contact. We don't want anything to do with them. 
Let me give you a clue as to what it might have been like. This is from 2010, not that long ago. But I don't know if how many of you are familiar with a flash mob. Okay, let me give you an idea of what it's like. I know what you do. Everybody knew the song. Could we pull off the Hallelujah Chorus? No, I'm not asking just a... But you can kind of see what happens. Are the people upset? Are they running away? Are they afraid? No, they're curious. Look at this. Look what's going on. How do we do this? Obviously, they've done some practice, and obviously, they've staged all of this just to be able to praise God. And it's just in a normal place where you go to eat lunch. There. What kind of praise does it take? What kind of message does it take? For us to be well, First of all, we all have to learn the song, right? Okay, that's enough. Why do that? What does that take? That's what it was like when Jesus marched in. It's a day like every other day. It's a road like every other road. They've been down it a hundred times. And here they are. All of a sudden, somebody is saying hallelujah. All of a sudden, somebody is shouting hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All of a sudden, it's a thing of praise and people are taking off coats and laying them on the road and they get to Jerusalem. What a great thing is this whole parade comes in and as you look at the end of this whole thing, you're able to see this, this great chorus and just different people have stood up when their time came and they just joined in the song and there's some that aren't part of it so they're just wandering and looking around and going, wow. But nobody's running away. Nobody's scared. They're just listening to the praise. What a great thing. And it happens at a food court. We would never think of a food court as being a place of praise. So let's not let it take away our voice just because we're outside of these walls, just because there might not be a PowerPoint 
just because it's a time when we need to be able to praise God. So what's accomplished? This is the scene right as they end. They just all go back to eating. Okay, well, did you do anything? Did you save anybody? Did you accomplish anything? What does worship do? It's not always the fact that, yes, we collected $50,000 today from people for the performance. No, there's no collection. It's just, we felt like praising God. And so they did. What an incredible thing, what an incredible time just to be able to say that. And that's true with Jesus. It's an incredible time and place. And as he goes into Jerusalem, okay, end of parade. If you look at Mark's version, it's the next morning before the thing continues where he goes to the temple. Matthew and Luke both record that he went from there into the temple. I don't know if all the people went with him or how many went with him. So what's the point? It's one week before his death. It's a time for confrontation and escalation. It's a time when you get in people's face and you say, I am son of God. And that's what Jesus is doing here. And you notice the audience participation like you saw here. The audience participation is... I'll get a palm leaf and and go over and wave it and I'll get something that allows me to be able to recognize this is a place where I can praise God, where I can say, this guy's Messiah. So what would happen if there was no sermon today? We just came in and sit and... What if Justin didn't lead any songs? Well, I know what would happen. We'd never actually sit down. We'd all just still be visiting, right? (laughs) My question is, would there be any praise that breaks out? We finally realize, well, it's getting late, so I guess we better all sit down. And sure enough, nobody's done anything. Nobody's getting up. Nobody's planned anything. Are we comfortable with that kind of silence? How long would you sit here? Well, we don't get out till 11.45, so would you stay till 11.45 just sitting here? Or would somebody start? Would somebody sing? Would somebody praise? It's one of those things that I think you ought to think about just a bit. In Matthew 21, the story continues. And Jesus entered the temple, and he drove out those who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you ever, never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. And so whether it's the same day or whether it's the next day, the thing is the same. They go in and they go into the temple. And it goes from a mood of great praise and great exaltation of the Messiah to all of a sudden the Messiah gets very, very angry. And he goes in and he starts driving out people and tearing up the place. And he starts overthrowing the money changers' tables. And those who are selling pigeon, he says, you're not going to do this in here anymore. He had already done this once at the beginning of his ministry, but now he makes a definite statement again. This is not the way my father's house is supposed to be. My father's house is to be a house of prayer. And that's what he does as he goes in and he clears out the money changers in the temple. My house is going to be a house of prayer. And you can see as how he might go in. Well, everybody's shocked. What happens when one guy goes crazy? Well, we all kind of stand around and watch. And that's what happens with Jesus. 
you've made it into a robber's den. And as he throws those people out, then the real worshipers come in. It's the blind and the lame. Does that strike you as odd? The blind and the lame and the children are the ones who come in. It's the ones who would find it impossible to get there. How is a blind man going to find Jesus in a temple? How is a lame man going to get to Jesus in a temple? But that's who's there now. Because Jesus heals. Because Jesus comforts. Because Jesus is the one who brings this awesome grace of God to those people who are hurting so much. And he touches their lives and he heals them and he comforts them and he says, this is what my father's house is like. It is a house of praise. And so you're able to see the temples calm again. Well, not for everybody because not everybody likes it. But they kind of got thrown out so there's not much they can do. They're crying again, Hosanna to the son of David, and that must just grate on their nerves so much. It's a recognition of a Messiah and a Savior. And Jesus teaches in the temple, and he heals in the temple, and the Pharisees just don't like that at all. The phrase comes, do you hear what they're saying? And I can just picture this as they come in, and they're so upset And they're thinking nobody would allow that to be said about them. And so they come in, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus turns around to them and says, yes! As if to say, do you hear what they're saying? Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have prepared perfect praise. Do you understand what that means? Do you know how that works? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise. I'm not sure that they got it. They can't grasp what's really happening. They can't understand the Messiah. If you look at Luke's version, in Luke 19 and verse 40, he says that they ask him this, and Luke's response is, I tell you, he replied, "If if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What an incredible thing. He says, now is the time for praise. Now is the time for them to be able to sing. Now is the time for them to shout Hosanna. It's a recognition of who he is. It's a recognition of what it means. And there are always people that don't get it. But that phrase, out of the mouth of babes and infants, when he responds back to them, where did Jesus get that? See, he didn't just make it up. It's Psalms 8. Let's look at Psalms 8 real quick. Yeah, you're going to need your own Bible for this one. Here's Psalms 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes and still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And you have given him dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's what he references. He calls for praise. What an incredible thing it is to realize that that's what Jesus is trying to say. These are the ones, the nursing infants and babes that are there, the blind, the lame, that come to him in the temple. And this is their prayer. How majestic is your name in all the earth. That God has made everything wonderful. He's made us. He's made us to have dominion. He's made us to be able to rule over fish of sea and birds of the air. 
And we can either claim our dominion or we can praise the God who gave it to us. And most people today will claim their own dominion and say, yeah, God gave me a place and I rule. I'm the one who does it. I'm the one who's in charge over fish of the sea and birds of the air. But you see, there are some of us who realize it's God who gave it to us. And there is a time of praise. There's a time of praise because all of this is so amazing of what God has made. So what are you going to do this week? What can you do to praise Him? Maybe there's a song that you know to sing. Maybe there's a prayer that you need to offer to God this week. Maybe you can go back and read Psalms 8 again and realize that you're watching or looking at a night sky or something that's outdoors and you can say, this is who you are. Is there a way that we can give praise? Can we do that this morning? Are you sure of your salvation? I would start there that you have this relationship with God that you're sure of all these things that are past, that praise starts when we put our life into His hands. And we do that as we repent of our sins, we're baptized into Christ and we are joined to Him. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin and praise begins at that point. I want to take Psalm 8. How majestic is your name? Or do we need stones to cry out? Can we do it instead of stones? Is that okay? All right, I hope you guys know this last song, because this is a song of praise. How majestic is your name? And we're going to sing that together. If you need to come to Jesus, come now as we praise. Majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, we praise your name. O oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God. O oh Lord, God Almighty. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God. O Lord God Almighty. You know what? Take us back. Let's sing it one more time. I learned this song this morning, and so I like it. So I, I like it better than my, my original choice. So. Hmm.